Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Nicholas back to the AA tonight. Uh, Nicholas is on sabbatical from Deep Seven. And actually, so am I, come to think of it. As a matter of fact, we shouldn't be here tonight, Nicholas. <laughs> um, like any creative individual, uh, Nicholas is dividing his endeavors, let's say, in at least two ways, um, teaching-wise and obviously practice. As a teacher, um, he's actually quite well known over here, the uh, Joint Unit Master of Deep Seven, along with uh, David Ajay and uh, Makoto Saito, since, uh, in various arrangements, basically since 2000. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at the Institute of Applied Theater Studies um, at Gießen University in Germany, and at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Karlsruhe. Um, that was in 2004. Um, actually, I just found out that next semester, he and David will be teaching an option studio at Penn, uh, which augurs actually lots of good things and, and lots of air miles as well. Work-wise, Nicholas is uh, an architect in practice based in Germany. He has uh, completed a number of projects, including um, Track 17 in Berlin in 1998. Um, the project that I first discovered his work through, which was the synagogue in Dresden, which I believe was exhibited in the front members room um, for about a month in 2001 or 2002. Uh, but he's also done sound uh, architecture, uh, a sort of media project for frequencies, Hertz, um, that was in 2002 in the Bockenheimer Depot Theater in collaboration with the choreographer William Forsyth. And that's one of the things that Nicholas will obviously uh, mention tonight. He does work a lot with artists. Um, he does work with performers, and that's actually a key aspect of his work. He's also curated projects. Um, he was the uh, curator of the Erzatstadt, Representations of the Urban, at the uh, Volksbühne uh, stage in Berlin, and was recently commissioned uh, with a research, um, a research project by the European Kunsthalle, which he told me a little earlier, the bar doesn't actually exist, but he probably exist that, uh, explain that a bit better. <laughs> He's also the author of several essays, um, including Stable and the Unstable Conditions in 2000, and he has a book coming out in 2006, which surprisingly is entitled On Boundaries, just like the lecture. His work uh, has been awarded a number of prizes. Um, Nicholas is really big in Europe, actually. He's got a number of them. Um, the BDA Prize in Berlin, 1998, and then the Art Prize of the 1822 Foundation in Germany, uh, the German Critics Award in 2001, the uh, Neue Welt uh, Award uh, in Frankfurt in 2004, and, and actually others. Uh, on a personal note, I would say that, yes, I think Nicholas is, is a truly sort of European architect in, in every sense of the word, and, and the unit um, he has been co-teaching um, at the AA with Makoto and David does stand for a number of things. Obviously, it is heavily rooted in, let's say, their own collaborations in practice with artists and performers, as well, actually, a, a real desire for materiality and. I would say for tangible things, and even I would say, although Nicholas tends to disagree with me, I would say that it's also rooted in a certain uh, pragmatism. In this context, I would say that, for me at least, Deep Seven does uh, give pragmatism a very good name in diploma school, which really is no mean feat at the AA. But without any further ado, I would like now to introduce uh, Nicholas Hirsch uh, for the lecture on boundaries. Thank you, George, for this very kind introduction. Um, I think it's, it's good to be uh, back at the AA, at least for a day. Um, but I, what I found was always interesting for me at the AA is that this, the school doesn't assume a specific role model for architects. So it's always something that has to be defined. Uh, so it's not presupposed what an architect has to do. 
and in this sense, the, the boundaries of what an architect is, um, is despite of the tradition of the discipline, not very clear. And, or if you want, it always has to be quest questioned. So tonight I want to talk about these boundaries and um, I will, would like to do this in a double sense. Um, first, um, it's about demonstrating the, uh, the limits and the range uh, of the profession, discussing the role of the architect in different contexts. And these contexts could range from construction sites to rather curatorial areas. And second, a notion of boundary as the physical element of architecture, an element that in a very literal sense negotiates different environments. And um, I think this will be quite clear that the idea of the material plays a crucial, quite crucial role in, in my work. And um, George has already mentioned that I think this was something we were trying to do also in, in our unit and uh, um, I think in that sense these two aspects of the notion of boundary demonstrate in a certain way the, uh, the hybrid construction in a way of the word or of the profession architect as such so it's uh, if you refer to etymology. Um, on the one hand, the architect has to deal with uh, material, with uh, tectonics, but in that respect he's much more than a tectonicos. He's, uh, he has to deal with arche, which means he has to deal with principles and with authority and with something that is very close to politics in a way. Could we switch off the lights, please? And I think this question of authority brings me to the first project I want to show. I will, I will show tonight some projects that are very different in terms of scale, very different also in terms of the role I played in these projects. So this first project is um, <coughs> something I did for an exhibition called Making Things Public, um, an exhibition created by Bruno Latour and Peter Weibel. And if politics is about things, as Latour and Weibel argue, for us the question was, what is then the politics of an exhibition space? How are things spatially organized? Uh, how are decisions made? Who organizes actually the territory? And the, uh, the architect, of course, in such an exhibition, in such a space, uh, has a quite critical position, even questionable, in respect to the profession's rather problematic heritage, its tendency to predetermine things, to fix things to um, a very fixed position, to an end state. And it was quite clear that we were in a certain way by our clients who we were misused. So they brought us in in a moment when they found out that in their exhibition that is about uh, an idea of the thing as something that brings together people that organizes space in a political way, that obviously um, it didn't happen what they expected, <coughs> that the, these over 300 exhibits didn't organize themselves. And um, so eventually they asked a specialist, an architect. And so in, with that kind of history in mind, um, we had to somehow play with this idea of the authority on space and um, what we did was a strategy where we accepted the authority but at the same time 
we rejected it immediately. We developed a certain set of rules, which was you see here on the on the top, you see the uh, the plan of uh, of the space. Uh, one of the rules was to um, that all the walls had to be linked to the existing existing grid of this rather industrial space of of the columns, and um, they. <coughs> They, um, these, these walls uh, were not allowed to be orthogonal. Um, that was one kind of um, rule. The other is that we uh, were searching for a, a tool, a material tool, that could be negotiated by curators, by artists, by, arti by, uh, by scientists. And this tool was the wall. So the wall is um, something you, you will see also in other projects now that will follow that the wall as well as ceilings and floors um, are for us very much elements that define space in, in a very explicit way and that has produced certain reactions on the way they are perceived. So, so this wall was, is a very traditional spatial limitation it's a boundary that organizes space. And um, what we did was actually to use the existing um, grid system they had at the museum. And it's, it's a kind of aluminum structure. And, but we were cladding it in a different way. So it was, we, we took the plaster away and uh, it was, went for a rather translucent material. And um, <coughs> This material was then, over the time, was completely uh, misused in a way. was was painted in, in partly or cut for uh, for monitors, etc. So, in, so in that sense, all these um, all these uh, different ways of perception of of uh, of organizing the space were extremely negotiable. So there was no nothing really fixed in the space. So that was the moment what, when we um, played kind of game with the curators. So they actually had to organize the space. And the product was somehow a, uh, a, completely, a complete change of the geometry of the existing space. And um, the product was also somehow the effect that they wanted to have, uh, certain ideas of assemblies, uh, of agglomerations of cells that where one cell was somehow communicating in a very strange way with the other. So the, the space was in the end very, very fluid and, and very, very difficult to grasp actually. So this is for us, uh, it was a very re recent project done uh, in March this year, and this was just to illustrate a bit the uh, kind of critical role that one has to play sometimes as an architect, where you are primarily asked to do a kind of dirty job for somebody who has a kind of problem uh, in organizing space and who, in that case who wants who had a difficulty to play out his own authority and therefore uh, sometimes to exert power you in space you very often ask an architect but in that respect um, we were developing the strategy to, to play the ball back in a certain way I'm coming now to a project which was actually the first project that we were doing and um, this project uh, illustrates, I think, quite well that this idea of building or of acting uh, at the boundaries of, of a prof profession is, is something that was in the works right in the beginning, um, by chance, one could say. Um, this is, um, I'm saying this is at the boundary of the profession because uh, I'm talking about a monument. And the monument is, of course, very <coughs> Um, difficult issue for architects, but it's, I would say, um, similarly difficult for artists. So it seems that uh, there's nobody really um, 
there, there are no real specialists for this. So it's, and at the same time, this um, monument has an enormous urban impact. It's uh, really on a, it's working on an, on a, on an urban scale. It's mainly um, um, based around the, the old Jim Jewish cemetery. So you see here the, uh, the old limitation of, the, uh, of Frankfurt, of the medieval Frankfurt, and uh, with the, uh, the dome, um, with, which is this black cross. And um, outside of this former wall, uh, the, uh, the Jewish ghetto and the Jewish cemetery. And so this is a, a monument for the Jews of Frankfurt. And the project somehow put into the center this old Jewish cemetery. <coughs> And very much basing on the difference between the inside and the outside. The inside is, is the old cemetery, and the outside is actually an intervention for a memory to the people who didn't have a grave. And um, the idea is very much to understand the idea of a monument not as something isolated or something that could be uh, somehow on a socal or, or really separated from, from, uh, from urban life or from everyday life, but it's something that is directly linked to urban life. Here you see these elements that we, uh, you see it here again in uh, more than 11,000 blocks of individual blocks of names on the exterior wall of the cemetery. It had to do, of course, with a certain notion of duration. It's something that is implicitly part of the idea of a monument. <coughs> so we were working here with a um, high quality of, uh, of steel, kind of inox steel, that was uh, the product of an, of an electric, electrically driven erosion process. So there's a, it's a positive and a negative. On the right side, you see, uh, you see the positive, and uh, on the left side, that's the result of this, this block with uh, an individual text. And here you see that this is not an intervention that is isolated, as I say. It's really exposed to urban life, to very arbitrary things like traffic, and also people ignoring that. And I think that's something very important, that the work has to also to be exposed to something that you cannot control, to, uh, to something that is um, also part of a certain risk, um, because you, it's the, the perception of such an intervention is something that you cannot control. So this is showing a rather daily or usual situation, people walking along the, the wall, and here sometimes they're stopping and looking at something, but it, this is happening in a, in a very uncontrolled way, something we, we cannot uh, really uh, um, plan. It's something that, that happens and, uh, uh, if it happens. Next project is the uh, the synagogue in Dresden. And um, I think the main question in Dresden was it, the, there was a community that was becoming much bigger than it was during the, the post-war era. And this community, uh, like there were lots of uh, immigrants coming from former Soviet Union, there was this idea of going back to the center of the city from a rather um, peripheral situation of the community. But in fact, the center of Dresden is something that is rather part of a nostalgic reconstruction process. You see here a poster <coughs> that you see everywhere in the city it's um, talking about 
uh, Dresden that it, one, that it happens to be in. It was before the war, before the, the uh, destructions. And so this is, in that city, I think urban planning is quite easy in the, in the center of Dresden because they have a plan. They have their old photographs and they reconstruct the city. But we were looking a bit closer to that image and actually wondered if, the, the, if there is the synagogue somewhere there because it's actually, uh, it um, had to be there. It was in, in the position on the top of this image. But actually this nice and nostalgic view is showing already a destruction. There was, there was the synagogue and it's erased. So th the whole image is taken before, uh, uh, after 30, uh, 1938. So it was quite clear um, this is a rather broken history and one has to, to deal with that site in a different way. And so the references to the city were for us quite, quite difficult in a way broken because continuity was, was broken. And we were looking for references um, that gave us an idea for a material strategy. And so we were in a way going very much back to what one could define as the primary architectural experiences of Judaism, which is, could be concentrated uh, to two buildings. Uh, one is the, on the left side, the temple, so the very stable building. On the right side, the tabernacle, kind of tent, the textile, which is very unstable. And this, these two conditions are very present throughout the whole literature of the Bible. And so this was a kind of basic uh, reference that we were taking right in the beginning of the project and so, somehow establishing a certain guideline for a material strategy. Concerning the, uh, the space or the site, um, we did something that was rather against the, the competition brief. We divided the two main areas of of the program, which is uh, community center and the synagogue, the religious space, and uh, created the public space. So this was for us something quite an important intervention uh, that caused a lot of discussions to bring in um, a, a bigger public than just the uh, the public of the community of the Jewish community. So this uh, the space in between is a public space that is always uh, part of a certain negotiation. That's the plan with the synagogue on the top. For the synagogue, um, there was um, this aim to build with a very heavy, stable material, um, which was um, a precast concrete with um, <coughs> natural aggregates from sandstone, from local sandstones. But the specific form was for us uh, a result of this very uh, geometric, um, of the geometric land, of, of the boundaries of this land. But we, uh, the idea was to follow this, this rigid restriction of an orientation in a very literal sense, orientation to the east. So the whole building is um, twisting somehow from layer to layer to eastern direction. It's a very, um, in a way, quite a simple operation, but creating <laughs> quite different views and perspectives onto the building. This is this public space. And here you see a, um, a drawing showing that this is actually, it's really a prefab building. So every stone is, is drawn. Um, that's, it's um, showing these huge elements. They ha it's a monolithic building, 60 centimeters of depth, um, and uh, in plan, 120 centimeters to 60. So this is um, showing the whole system, 
that's in a way the building of the synagogue. That's how it was constructed. It's actually uh, quite an, in terms of time, very efficient in terms of the ingredients of building, quite traditional. Uh, so it was built with mortar. It's, it's, uh, it's in that sense very traditional, but using uh, it in a very efficient way. It was the whole thing was built in three months. That's this rotation of the building. So the whole geometry as a whole as a total geometry is curvilinear, but as it is built in completely straight and orthogonal layers, uh, it's um, actually quite, it was quite simple to build it because every single block and stone is rectangular. That's a drawing of um, a corner of the building where you have the, uh, the biggest cantilever about uh, 50 millimeters from stone to stone of cantilever, which uh, in total is uh, something like one meter 80 of cantilever, which is on the one side of the building, it's positive, on the other side, it's negative. It's a detail of the corner. Going to the interior, it's, um, as I told you, it's, it's about a textile building in the interior, referring to the tabernacle, and which also had, you don't see it here, it has this function uh, of also creating an intimate community, but in the cases of the, uh, of the big and holy days, these, uh, the textile is wrapped and really changed to a different geometry. So we were, if um, George was also in the introduction mentioning the interest of material strategies. Here, um, I have to say this, the impact of material research is also that it takes a lot of time and sometimes you don't see the, the result uh, right from the beginning because we're most often not working with existing products or with rather, we're rather interested to develop um, with a manufacturer or a company a certain product and to really build something that is specific <laughs> to a certain architectural problem or to a building. In that case, it was the idea of the textile, it's a metallic textile, brass, and um, in a way we were talking during the, the process of planning this building, we were talking about this for months and years, I think it was probably two years, uh, with without really showing the client uh, a sample or something tangible and perceivable. And we only had something in mind and all the samples and all the tests uh, were gone wrong because it was just too rigid because we were actually working with companies um, that whose context was rather a very architectural context. So everything was um, far too rigid and we wanted something tangible, rather smooth that you could touch because you, you see here that people are also sitting to this spatial limitation very closely and uh, so that was important to, to touch it. So eventually we um, came to, a, to somebody, here you see the, uh, the result, how it is hung from the ceiling. Eventually we, we came to to a manufacturer who was actually um, working rather in the context of clothing. He was producing clothes for Paco Rabanne, that's an example here from 1970s. Uh, and um, so this was after two years the, uh, the solution for us or the, the right uh, company to work with even though of course uh, the guy from, from this company was really shocked when we told him, well, it's not about the clothes. Um, we are talking about 800 square meters. So this was uh, quite a difficulty, but uh, th it was solved in the end. You see how it's suspended from the ceiling. Next project I want to show is um, 
the the conversion of a of a depot theater it's a project that we uh, did with William Forsyth the choreographer and I think this was for us a very important project because it had to do with this problematic role of an architect and the, the culture of planning that you somehow feel deep inside you and um, on the other way on the other hand what had, ag had again this material logic the aim of Forsyth was to open the theater to to bring a larger community into the theater so it was open from 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock and this was um, a kind of aim to to run different programs at the same time very formal programs like performances with a rather fixed audience like here in this space or um, very informal happenings like um, kids playing around or people reading things or very improvised performances you see uh, the plan of the building so it's three t it's the same plan plan three times but the there was a certain boundary be between a rather formal setting, which is uh, the lower part of the building, and uh, the area close to the foyer, which was completely uh, informal, um, rather modular system that was actually uh, um, rather arranged by, uh, by the users, by the people. We were trying to arrange something for the opening of that building uh, we were working the whole night and it was disastrous so we uh, uh, gave this up and uh, just piled uh, the elements and then the people were working with it and i think the uh, here you see the interior so the the this, the material strategy was to allow a certain parallelity of programs by reducing the impact of sound a lot with very uh, um soft materials, felt material here, natural felt. You, d you see also the uh, this um, wall between the f the, uh, this rather formal and informal area, which was kind of very ambiguous thing between fixed wall and something uh, changeable and textile. you see uh, an overview of many of the uh, of, of the programs that we had so it was extremely different situations and i think the main issue for us was this idea of the, of the collaboration with the choreographer because it was quite clear that we were trying to plan things to draw things accurately and to uh, understand the idea of planning as something that is also guaranteeing, gu guaranteeing a certain coherence throughout the project. And that's something that uh, also in a long conversation with Bill Forsyth um, was, was discussed, that as an architect, you somehow, del yeah, you, you somehow have another understanding of what memory is in a project. So the, the drawing guarantees a certain memory and guarantees coherence in order to get a certain build result after several months or years. Whereas in choreography and mainly I think also in, in uh, Bill Forsyth's approach, which is primarily about a technique of improvisation, here it was, it's about a very short time period. So it's really about improvisation and most of the plans that we were drawing were just useless because uh, our client, or it was actually not a client, it was collaboration, Bill Forsyth, he, he was just not reacting to the plans and time was passing and, and that's a situation where you sort of feel yourself um, immediately that plans don't help you and that you, you are physically thrown back in a one-to-one -one situation where you have to react with your body 
And actually, most of these felt elements that we build and and uh, also kinds of furnitures, they were actually not based on a piece of paper, not on a drawing, but they were actually uh, produced or I would say designed, if this is the right word here, um, in the rehearsal um, space uh, of, the, of the ballet company and where we took existing pieces of the space and uh, this choreographer was kind of stretching my, my body and was doing things with me and showing me certain things uh, certain movements, you're not doing them with your body, but we want to allow them in the space, and therefore your plans are completely wrong, and forget about these. So everything was fixed in this <coughs> rehearsal space, and in that sense, uh, I think this was a very important experience um, where you kind of see that your method of planning, of having control, of really clear, clearly setting the boundaries also of protecting yourself and protecting your design. Sometimes this method doesn't work and uh, I think this is something which we're trying partly to introduce in other projects but I think it was very specific in this project because usually um, the frame is a different one. So concerning these different events uh, I told you this, uh, there were concerts like this one. It, it was mainly the <laughs> idea of bringing in something like like uh, an opening to the theater context, to bring in something like uh, an urban life. Actually, uh, the program was called, was created by Louise Neri, who's also here tonight. And um, the program was called Public Life. And this was the, the, the test, in a way. This was, of course, rather organized. There were uh, discussions like uh, inviting Utopia Station, people like was, were also hanging around in, in the models we designed, but also hanging around also meant something like performances like this one from Boris Schamatz, um, who was um, proposing a performance that really changed the behavior of people, how they sit uh, during a lecture or how they behave. Don't, don't try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this um, material strategy with the felt um, also eventually was, was then used in uh, Bill Forsyth's um, piece, Where? I see it here, which was uh, about a very small prototype of a house, or kind of igloo made out of felt. But the pu real, really public life was also beyond, that was beyond the curated space and the, uh, the, the programmed space. It was something um, that was brought in, unplanned in a way, by, uh, mostly by parents coming in with their children during winter time. And when I, in, I think in one of the first images of that project, I was showing these, the different pro programs that were thought to run parallel and I think this was also here this image to show the, the limits of parallelity and of kind of multi-programmed spaces because um, we found out that the uses and the different programs they are not neutral they're not uh, exchangeable <coughs> and some uses are much stronger than others and we found out the, the strongest uses that we can find are children because they're extremely were extremely noisy and much faster than in their movements. That was, of course, something that Forsyth interested was was interested a lot. That the movements was were much faster than the movement of uh, of all the people. And this, uh, I think, the effect of this was also to 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 change somehow the the rhythm and the the, the programmed schedule of the building in the following year. So it was also uh, really, I think, a certain experiment to open a space to the public and it was at the same time about understanding the limits of this and the limits of that, of, the, of certain phenomena that you can plan and others 
certainly we found out you can't plan it and they uh, sort of backfire uh, to the whole program. Next project I'm showing is um, a community center in Munich. Here the, uh, the problem is in a way that it's a project in the middle of a city, in the center of a city, and the program is actually um, much too big for this uh, rather small fabric of the town and uh, approximately 20,000 square meters. And the strategy was to somehow define the, the relationship between this community and the larger public of the city in a different way to um, somehow identify different units in the program. It was a bit like scaling down but also to strengthen this, the uh, specific identities of the different programs. So the programs are a community center uh, with social services, a school, apartments, sports center, uh, a museum, and uh, it, the whole thing is also um, planned by, uh, by different clients. So the system also um, provided us with a certain opportunity to uh, separate problems also, to uh, clearly uh, define limits, boundaries between clients, and also boundaries between different programs, and at the same time um, guarantee uh, certain coherence through the material. So, so the whole system is a kind of conglomerate building, with different units, and um, we were interested in, in a certain balance between the coherence of a project and the autonomy of its different parts. That's something we are uh, building at the moment. Um, don't have, it, have very recent images, but yeah, so this uh, one building, this another, these cubes. That's the museum here. Yeah. It's also this approach that we are doing very much uh, large scale models. Test for a facade. That's on site. That's also, I think, it in relation to the, uh, to the Dresden Synagogue, it's a much more <coughs> complex program. So this is the, uh, the synagogue for, for Munich during construction. Now I'm coming to a quite different context, which is um, a new project we're doing in Georgia, uh, not USA, but um, Caucasian area. And it's um, firstly a bit uncomfortable to be a asked to do something there, uh, you, you feel a bit, well, you, you're probably not unhappy to uh, have the chance to build something, but, and it was a small competition uh, between three offices, and we, we won this competition, but actually we're still not quite sure if it's, if uh, we, we should really be happy about this, because the context is actually a bit like this map, and so it's, Everything has, you see Georgia there, well it's written in German, but you can see it in yellow, and it's, it's, there's a lot of um, undefined limits in, on every level of the society. So they, uh, they, the, uh, the, s the state is, of course, they had a revolution, it's a democratic state, and, but it's still, there are several um, republics that were fallen apart from the main republic of Georgia, so there are a lot of refugees in the uh, in the city, but now they have money through because there there's this uh, oil pipeline going through the country uh, coming from the Caspian Sea and but you feel really a bit scared when you see <laughs> this that was the f the first meeting for lunch with our <laughs> client and we knew that with from mobile phones, of course, but uh, this is a bit different. And in fact, 
this is when you start to build there. This is in the uh, situation in the uh, in the planning department of Tbilisi, the, the capital of Georgia. Um, <coughs> you see that the the bound even the boundaries of a site is uh, something that can be negotiated. So the whole n notion of there is of course a site, but um, if for instance you build underground, so there is you will see a section which is here. So there's from the left side there's a there's a tube station um, attaching to the building, and the uh, the building as such on above ground this is uh, exactly on on the limits of of the site, but um, underground we are expanding and this is obviously something um, that is not really a problem so building on public ground um, I think it's in respect of many of the discourses we know from previous years uh, and also from a project that will show a bit later in kind of discourses in urbanism that were very much about a very romantic and idealistic notion of of uh, of the illegal, of something spontaneous, negotiable, etc. I think if you see it in in hard facts, it's it's sometimes a bit scary, but it's at the same time, it's you somehow accept it um, if your responsibility is uh, clearly defined. Because that's, of course, something that I would like to point out that you, that there is something like a responsibility, uh, also to towards your office, to your employees, to everybody, that you you are somehow dependent on certain rules, because otherwise, uh, imagine a situation that uh, the mayor or somebody uh, there's a certain changement in that city and they don't accept uh, building on public ground, you, you end up in prison, maybe, I don't know. But uh, I think this this whole negoti negotiation of the boundary is something critical. Um, the same rules in in the city um, are actually a, a reason why we are still interested in this uh, project and why we um, will build it quite soon, because the uh, the building laws allow. Um, a huge depth in, in the in, in buildings. Like this is an office building mainly with uh, some shops uh, in the lower parts of the building, and it's actually a bit higher than this one now. So this was also part of negotiation, and so it's uh, 11 floors right right now, and um, so this this depth of the building it's um, it's in each direction it's uh, 53 meters approximately which for an office building is quite a lot and there's uh, of course a certain issue of light um, because um, it's probably not um, London might not be that extreme as Germany in Germany they're completely crazy about light so th therefore you see in Germany you see extremely uh, um, narrow buildings so they, they, the plan is you, you can somehow def define and quickly perceive something as a as a German floor plan of an office building. And here we have the contrary, uh, so it's extremely deep, and the, uh, the strategy is to, to break certain holes into the building from several parts. Here you see some, um, some plans of the buildings. So these holes come partly from the side, partly from the top of the building, um, with different um, possibilities to arrange office office plans in, in that way. You see a first perspective of the building uh, with these holes. It w will change a lot, but it's uh, it's the first issue. I just want to show this to somehow um, critically demonstrate this um, problem of of certain rules that limit that limit you as, as an architect, but at the same time they give you kind of starting point, they give you, like in this case, uh, as I think, quite an interesting typology that you can work with. This is certainly a, only a starting point. Uh, the whole uh, facade system will, will change a lot. I just want to show this to, to show the, uh, the, to demonstrate the system. Now I'm coming to a project that we're, yeah, 
that we will uh, open in two weeks or ten days. It's um, the Hinsert Document Center. It's um, it's an extremely provincial area near Luxembourg, and uh, very idyllic landscape. There's nothing around. A uh, rather small village, and um, this is a document center. It's kind of a, a museum for that area, but it, its main purpose is actually uh, that uh, this area what is not that remote as it seems, and it's not that idyllic as it seems, because this was actually the area of a um, of a camp for political prisoners in the uh, in 1940s, early 1940s, from. Uh, approximately 15 European countries. So it has uh, a very European impact in a way. So here you see different countries from where these prisoners came. And um, we were quite fascinated by, uh, by this by the landscape that you see here. And start from there a certain um, discourse about the, the topographies of, of, uh, of this landscape. Um, it's a museum with um, a very uh, very interior um, atmosphere. So it's mainly uh, th th certain objects, relics, um, quite a lot of films. So it's very, very interior. And it was um, a very intuitive process in a way. So it's not the result of uh, a completely systemic approach. It was, it was starting with a, a plan from the main exhibition hall that was um, very simple, but then the, the, uh, the brief of the building changed over time very much. There, there are certain pockets of uh, smaller libraries, um, smaller um, boxes for, for exhibits that were pushing the building t to the outside. The whole building is built in a cortine steel material. This is uh, from May. There's, there's now a kind of varnish-like, so it's, uh, it's a bit darker now. So the main construction is the cortine steel. It's a load-bearing facade in that sense. Here you see uh, um, on the top the, the different um, ingredients of the building. So the, the, the main uh, volume in which um, there's a certain, um, in which the, this one is the, uh, the main exhibition area here with a seminar room. The, This is this, we're quite interested in this idea of a certain ambiguity of, of the contour line, of, of certain um, uncertainty of this. And this is a drawing of the contour line, of putting all the plans on top of each other. The whole building was built in segments. the company where they controlled the uh, geometry and then transported onto the side. It's 12 millimeters and spanning over um, approximately um, something like bit between 15 and 18 meters. This is one of the sections where you see uh, this uh, facade and the whole system, which was actually, of course, quite complicated with this load-bearing facade uh, and all the systems. Here you see uh, from the main exhibition room an elevation, so it's wrapped around the space. The whole geometry follows in a way this, uh, the exterior geometry. So it's kind of, it's a, in a way it's a historical um, exhibition with um, lots of um, 
certain exhibits that were relics in a way and a lot of uh, printed work. You see in the office, the, I think hundreds of these tests um, of the main room. That's on site. Um, so the, the interior is um, it's in a way a kind of wooden box. And um, we wanted to, to link the information directly with um, the wooden panels. So there is, in that sense, there is no application. Every, everything is uh, directly print on, printed on, on these wooden panels. This was some of the tests that we did. So the effect is um, kind of negotiation between the natural aspect of the wood and the uh, the printing technique, the uh, the exact grid. That's a drawing from um, that shows some of the openings of seminar rooms and offices. Um, I don't have very recent photos of, of, of the glass, it's probably uh, later. There you see on the right side, you see these openings where there's no glass inside at the moment. This is building. So it's, um, changing according very much according to uh, different times of the year now it's getting winter it's a very recent photograph uh, you see that there's, there's more uh, uh, condensation on on the facade and you you get these uh, interesting patterns on the roof so it's uh, the whole structure is wrapped around here that's the roof of the building the landscape. Okay, now I'm coming to um, so the Hinze Document Center was um, was most recent building will be open in 10 days, 10, 14 days. Um, now I'm coming to uh, some projects that similar to the collaboration ship we did with William Forsyth um, are very much based on on the problem of collaboration and uh, reflects again these two aspects that I mentioned before, the, uh, the role <coughs> of the architect, of a planner who determines space, who determines boundaries, and at the same time, um, the boundary as something very physical that has a very specific material logic. This is a project we did um, for uh, an exhibition on sound artists, where it was very much about the idea of translation between visual phenomena and acoustic phenomena. And here you see, um, I don't know how many, um, let's say 18 uh, different plans of the same structure. It's a very narrow existing building and we were asked to develop a structure to organize an exhibition uh, or a piece of architecture that organizes 12 different contributions from 12 different artists, um, people like Carsten Nikolai or uh, Ryoji Keda or Angela Bullock was also part of that show. And um, we were providing this system that was something like um, different channels, sound channels, um, a certain rhythm of very narrow areas that worked as a kind of sound channel and wider areas for the installation. So it was really, a, the exhibition was somehow stretched um, and was very much a rhythm of, uh, of sound and visuals. And of course we had no idea um, in the beginning there was not enough information coming from um, from the curators and um, so we just proposed a very simple system which uh, something like that one on the left side but it was actually really regular and the uh, over time there were 
discussions with the artists, with the curators, and the, the rhythm became more and more complicated and complex. And um, we also had one um, contribution from Ryoji Ikeda, who was actually, you see it on the, on the right side, the, uh, the wall, um, you see maybe this, this double line, so he moved into the wall. So the, the whole system is just to show the idea of a certain manipulation where you certainly establish with certain authority something quite rigid, one could say, a system, but the exact rhythm or the exact um, geometric formulation is actually not part of your control. So this was very much a negotiation between curators and artists. So this was really um, not our job, even though we had to draw all these plans, but it was rather a certain, uh, certain response to it. This was, uh, that's upset, it's turned wrong, but um, that's uh, on the top you see the, this, the, the final form of, of this structure. It's uh, work from Carmichael von House Hauswolf um, showing this translation between a visual that you see on the right side and uh, acoustic phenomena that you see on this, this table with a direct relationship that we're showing. So it was um, an intervention that was extremely, um, even monumental in a certain way, it was very uh, a very strong structure and this was done p for purpose because usually these kind of works are shown rather in a very autonomous way. So every piece usually gets its own logic. In that sense, here, um, every piece got its own space, of course, but it was seen in relation to other works as a transition also of sound throughout these sound channels. And um, in, in that respect, I think the, the material becomes quite crucial, so we had to reduce the, uh, the reverberation time a lot. So the material was a very uh, extreme foam, a white foam, um, developed um, specifically for, for that exhibition because there was also very, of course, very strong fire requirements uh, in, in this show. And um, this white foam was um, also used, also shown in its, in its material and its depth because all the information was integrated into the foam. So this uh, is one of these effects of the rhythms where you suddenly saw certain reflections of light that were working in combination with sound. Something similar was done in for the Museo Cervales in Porto. We were invited to uh, do a collaborative work with uh, some musicians, and we were f primarily asked to to work in a museum. And the museum was built by uh, Alvaro Cesar, and but this is an extremely specific building that is not very easy to play and to where you probably as an as an architect you have a certain difficulty to uh, do something in there. So we moved into the park, we have a fantastic park in Porto and um, we were looking somehow for a, a common ground with the musicians and um, kind of notational system. So we were looking at an existing piece of um, of the park, which is a very geometric configuration of hedges, the rose garden called. And um, on the right side you see um, it's a bit like a scan of all the elements that you can find in this park. And this was um, the common ground for the musicians and for us. So they were playing um, this notational system and we were extruding this and uh, the combination was a kind of, kind of installation um, here in the park. 
five layers. Um, so it was very much this this notion of of the music based on notation and on a three dimensional version, a kind of reconfiguration of the existing geometries of the park. The material was um, something we, we found in, in Porto and that you could find everywhere. It's um, because the name of this piece of park is the Rose Garden. Um, so we were uh, trying to uh, to buy some, some roses in Porto also and um, suddenly, suddenly we, we, we saw these uh, foam elements where you stick the roses into. So it's kind of very... Uh, <laughs> It's it's a kind of foam that gets extremely uh, um, nearly liquid in the end, so it really destroys itself after several months, and uh, so this was was used for for this project. So this is something um, we're doing quite often. That the material strategy is also linked to a certain idea. Well, you could call it intuition also, or something that has a certain um, narration also in itself. I would like to finish with um, two projects that are um, where the idea of of the architect um, is probably beyond uh, the physical building. One is the uh, the European Kunsthalle in Cologne. It's actually in uh, a project or an institution that doesn't exist physically. So it's um, part of a, or result of a certain history of, of uh, an existing Kunsthalle in Cologne. And there was a competition, there was a first prize, they had a winner, and uh, it was a very uh, clever system, a public-private partnership. <laughs> and um, Problem was the uh, the investor got bankrupt and um, and they had already demolished the old Kunsthalle. Uh, <laughs> shit happens. So this is uh, the Cologne Kunsthalle, <laughs> and and this was the start of initiative uh, from different artists from Cologne. They raised money. It was completely private. This initiative. They raised money and founded this uh, European Kunsthalle, the appointed uh, director, that's Nikolaus Schaffhausen. And um, we're working now, we were appointed as, uh, as those who are, who are working on, on a spatial analysis, but this, uh, that's a project we're doing with um, Markus Miesen, who's probably also here, and Philip Misselwitz. And uh, so it's a real AA connection in a certain way. And um, we are doing with other experts a kind of research project that is mainly interested in um, this question, how much architecture do you need for such an institution? So it's, uh, I think on, on every panel I have to uh, make clear that I'm, I won't be the architect of some, of of the thing or the, of the institution that might come out here. Uh, it's of course, uh, sometimes credibility is quite low in that, but um, I won't be the architect here. And because we are mainly interested in, um, in a relationship between um, the, uh, the spatial, really physical parameters of a Kunsthalle or of an, of an art space and um, parameters that come rather from an economic context. So we are doing a research, it looks a bit dry at the moment, but uh, that's just what we are, we were, how we were starting on a European basis. We are analyz doing analysis fr uh, of different European institutions, art institutions, and uh, looking at the, uh, the size of buildings. Also, um, we got um, in some cases uh, still secret uh, budget in informations on budgets and uh, how much uh, institutions have to spend to run a building and how much money they have to do exhibitions uh, and so on. So this is um, a project that um, is really 
interested in this um, critical role also also of the architect and of somehow also criticizing something that um, happens quite often that you produce really uh, uh, great museums but you don't in the end you don't have the money to uh, to run exhibitions so this is part of the or is the basic problem actually that we're working on uh, in this project and um, I think the next project or the last project that will show is um, something where the architect tends to work somehow in the in the area of curators or something I was curating even though I was always saying I'm planning it but um, they called me curator and um, it's something um, I did at the uh, at the Berlin Volksbühne theater and it's actually it was uh, a three-day event um, so very short time but uh, an extreme input of of manpower, of budget, etc., and was actually a conference. So it's just if we talk about different scales in this profession, we have seen different buildings um, in a certain size, and uh, I think this is probably the uh, the shortest shortest thing I've done so far. It was uh, just it was something that was appearing three days, um, but actually uh, um, I think in terms of work it was three years so it was comparable in terms of the planning it was I think was quite similar to um, architecture but actually lots of the discourse here was about um, about an experience of urbanism of cities as something very uh, ephemeral and ver very um, very much based on, on rather situation as uh, strategies so it was in that sense the contrary so it was um, called Ersatzstadt Repräsentation des Urbanen Representations of the Urban just three days this year this plan of the building that was that was just the plan of the first day of that event so on Saturday it was a different plan and uh, Sunday again different uh, and so in that sense this this role of the architect was in that case of myself was rather that one of somebody who was programming that building and much less of somebody who was building something or drawing something even though uh, I uh, was drawing something but I had somebody at the theater who was building things so I had my in a way my own designer and uh, who obviously did these things much better and um, so there were in this first evening there was um, this combination between a performative approach uh, a theatrical approach uh, like you see here these five actors uh, from the Volksbühne theater and they were actually um, performing um, architectural discourse so it was uh, a specific text uh, based on uh, all the, f the godfathers of uh, temporary uh, urbanism debates like uh, Sawyer, Mike Davis, etc. And uh, so they were doing a kind of prepared um, conference uh, in this, this uh, context of the theater. And um, we were also preparing um, a certain infrastructure for these three days of of, the, of this event and this was mainly of course infrastructure in that sense wasn't the physical limitations of the building not these boundaries it was an infrastructure that was uh, purely about uh, consuming food and and liquids and uh, so it was a project run by by superflex Danish artist superflex is uh, the open source beer and you're probably also quite thirsty now and um, that's probably how I would like to end. So it was rather about uh, showing the uh, quite a wide range. So I'm um, certainly aware of a s certain risk to show so many different formats. Uh, I could have probably reduced it much more to, an, to an 
rather descriptive model of uh, of architectural discourse of the buildings as such. Um, but uh, I wanted somehow to to show this this range of of uh, of work um, that, from my point of view, is part of the possibilities of, of an architect nowadays, but at the same time of uh, certainly the risks also of doing architecture nowadays, because it's not not for sure that uh, we cannot assume that this profession will will last forever. So it's uh, yeah, because I think that um, I think the limits of our profession they're very well established. So we are, if you build, you have to uh, be part of certain legal associations, etc. And uh, I think all these legal instruments are, um, I think, has, have also to be seen in a historical context. They were invented in 19th century for the most part, and um, that's also what when we can sort of see a certain splits between artists, uh, engineers, and architects. And and uh, I think we we might. Um, we might see in the, in the next few years uh, an erosion of these very uh, very strict boundaries between the pr professions and uh, I think there, there are lots of examples also in London like people like Cecil Belmont also um, being probably much more influential than most of the architects nowadays. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Okay. Yep, I had a, a quick question for you, Nicholas. I, looking at the um, the very first project you showed, um, this perimeter of the Jewish cemetery in Frankfurt, was it? And the two synagogue projects. I was just um, thinking of similar briefs and projects. Uh, done by Daniel Liebeskind, of all people, and what sort of came quickly in my mind was that the Liebeskind sort of take on, let's say, sort of the the sacred in the Jude, uh, Judaist tradition is um, seems to be very voluble, seems to be very symbolic, mm. uh, very graphic. Um, one doesn't always understand what that symbolism is about, but there is kind of hyper sort of activity of, of, of symbolism, of, of graphism, of things. Uh, by comparison, uh, your own sort of, let's say, take on that seems to be very mute, very silent, uh, relying on sort of beautiful pristine surfaces, materials, uh, very, very sort of quaint. I mean, would you somehow agree with this characterization or...? Yeah, I have to agree. Um, because I think it's... Um, I think it's obvious what you say. And I always felt... Because um, when, you, when you are asked to... Uh, Build a synagogue, or when you are not asked, but primarily you you are participating in a competition, and you are of course working in a certain context. You cannot pretend that these examples that you you have mentioned do not exist, so you know them. And but I always felt that um, this symbolism um, is, for me at least, it's highly problematic. So because it always um, says to the uh, to the visitor how to feel. So I think it's extremely didactic, and uh, that's something I uh, kind of mistrust and have real doubts. And and um, maybe I'm I'm more interested in um, in the material logic, um, which of course has also traps and 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 uh, a certain contingency, but. Uh, I think this is another way to um, to experience a space, um, probably in a more subtle way, and uh, I think that's that's what what, what I'm interesting in, I'm, I'm interested in, and uh, so I'm less less fascinated by these uh, configurations that very often are kind of worlds of plaster, and I think that's. I think I have not shown one uh, ob one building with pla where you see plaster. It's probably something for when I'm 60. Uh, 
I'm interested in the museum where you, the documentation center, in the remote area you show the interesting pattern for the landscape. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you are using very interesting material, but how about the form, like when you design the building, is there any particular reason for the triangular form, the steel surface? Yeah, it started somehow with these, um, I think the materials um, was firstly a decision that was uh, done by um, by looking at the landscape or, or just by, by being there because we were quite interested by uh, this change of the landscape between um, in winter time it's, it's really a brownish kind of it's, it's very uh, doesn't have a very specific color but it's very close to that uh, effect that we are producing so it's quite in winter time it's it's very similar to the landscape in whereas in summertime it's really the opposite it's really green versus this this kind of uh, brownish texture so it's it's uh, it's very much about a difference and um i think the second step was to say um that we want to build a building that um where the facade is really something um extremely solid extremely uh, is really uh, something that supports also the building so it's load bearing and that's when we started of course to when, when you think about the thickness of a material when you come very quickly to inclinations and triangles because it's, it's, it's primarily a matter of, of stiffness so that's how it started and then it was um, a rather intuitive process then so and of course, very specific parameters, uh, simple things that you don't see here in, in the drawings, because we're not so much interested in um, in certain repetition of, of drawings. But what is, of course, part of the logic is that uh, you would like you want to get the water away from the roof. So this this produces certain inclinations, and you have to uh, to keep certain angles, etc. So this was um, somehow the, m the main work, actually, uh, concerning the roof structure. So it has to, had to span and at the same time um, not to produce uh, holes where you have uh, little lakes of water. I think this. Uh, are you addressing the question of of the felt as such, or the choice of felt, or yeah, the Roman? Generally, there is the, um, the quietness or the resonance yeah. or the minimalism of the design on the one hand, and mm. the permissiveness yeah. which you actually anticipate yeah. or expect. I think it was uh, it was very much part of the strategy for for that building, and um, also to to create rather something like a background. And the whole also felt was uh, also had to do with a uh, question of colors. So there was already an existing color on the wall on the walls of this building that were very similar to this uh, natural felt. And um, so this this was something that we were interested in, and was also a collaborative uh, decision. And um, it was also something that where we knew that we could use this, these elements um, in very different ways without making them too, too important. And uh, so it's, it was very discreet in that sense. But 
um, I think it's partly something that it's, it's very difficult to experience on photographs because the the whole space so it was very um, very difficult space purely firstly purely in terms of um, speech of understanding each other and um, we the space was rather naked in a way and um, we we brought in this in enormous amount of of textile and this changed the space completely and was everywhere like on the floor and these these modules walls partly so people were um and this this was very much part also of bill forsyth's strategy to say um do something with the floor because the floor that's that's the main that that's that's the basic uh thing for a human uh that's 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 what we uh, what he wanted us to to do or to uh, to make this uh, an element of the floor to m should should be somehow inhabitable for, uh, for the people not just to stand let, like i stand on this carpet here but also to to lie there to sleep to to do very different movements and this was i think in that sense this project worked very well because um, you saw behaviors that you would usually not see in public spaces. And um, so the whole idea of protections, of limit, limits between private and public spaces uh, was, was really different because people started to build um, also a little private area, but, but this, it was still extremely soft in a way. It's on now. Um, my question concerns uh, the point at which one leaves the individual object and moves into liaison among objects and among people. Uh, in other words, the transition from a single building to an urban space or to a terrain. And some of your projects seem to be on the threshold of this in various ways. Um, Indeed, even the Dresden Synagogue is two buildings. It's a relation between two buildings, even though I suppose most of the attention has been given to that astonishing tectonic talk or twist that you've produced in a single building and the relation of one block to the next. And um, this has always interested me, where you, ha you have an architect who perhaps uh, withdraws somewhat from uh, pure geometric speculation, certainly the kind that Liebeskind would have had in his early experiments, towards working with, with tectonics. But then, in returning to the public realm and to space and to the horizontal extent, um, has to find uh, new points of uh, new ways of orienting and, and uh, determining that space. And it's interesting that two of your projects here uh, have, uh, uh, have, have used theatre and I wonder if, if you've thought about this that, that your work, uh, my impression is that your work began with a concern with the materiality of, uh, of, of tectonic jointing and the object but of course the more ambitious the projects that become the more you move into, into public space and that requires a different approach to, to geometry. Yeah, maybe you're right. We we are very often starting with with the material and maybe something you could define as something very uh, really small scaled in a way. And um, but I think that that in in all of these ca or most of the cases that I've shown, this has a very immediate impact on large scale. So it's. So in that sense, we are working very much on on transitions and on on flows of of people and and analyze uh, how a certain pattern of a city works. And of course, uh, most of the photographs are very much uh, close-ups on, on on the buildings. 
but uh, for instance, you were mentioning the Dresden Synagogue, and it it has actually, uh, I think, a, a very big impact on the texture of the city, on the fabric of the city, because we were doing something that was criticized by nearly everybody in the city. So we had, because this, they read what we did, they didn't read this as a piece of architecture, but primarily, as you say, as something that, as an urban intervention, as, as really a large-scale urbanism, because um, you mentioned that we were interested in this, uh, in the in the volume of the synagogue, that's right, and was a very, very clear decision f from our part to say that this building should be very, very obvious in a way, in from from the other side of the river, and uh, should be part of the silhouette of of the city of Dresden and. And this was criticized, of course, because we were uh, sort of seemingly destroying some sidelines to uh, monuments that were supposed much more important than the synagogue. But then you also start to discuss with those people. So how do you how do do you evaluate the uh, a, a monument? Which monument is more important? Uh, than the other, so I think this, this, this were very important discussions because we, of course, to to do such a project, you have to get uh, a building permission, and nearly every group in the city is asked to div to give a comment from those who are who just want to pass with their bicycle there, and it was much too narrow, so it didn't work at all. With our greatest enemies, certainly. And um, on the other end, there was um, the head of the, the historical monuments department, and he was against the project because it was we were sort of blocking some some sidelines. And at the same time, we were. I think one of our main arguments was, of course, that to say, this was something discussable, of course, to say, <laughs> the synagogue should be visible primarily. But at the same time, this operation gave something to the city, and which was this, um, like if you were really stretching the the uh, the site to a to, to a maximum and with these two buildings, and we were creating this space in between. And this space in between um, is, is, I think, something very important because it's a space that it's not quite clear to whom this space belongs because it's mostly open to the city, but sometimes during the religious days they close it for a couple of hours, so it's a, but, but with very simple tools, so you, you don't, this was for us a kind of horror scenario that you get the feeling to of a, of a prison or um, kind of, in, in Germany we always say uh, Stammheim, where the, the Red Army fraction was um, was present, and um, so this this was the effect that we wanted to avoid, and um, in that sense, we are really. Uh, I'm really happy with this space in between because it's it's um, also talking about a certain option of, and certainly about a lot of problems between different communities. That's yeah. That's a community building uh, with social services. Um, so there's a lot of um, it's, m it's much more informal there. So on, on one hand, uh, there are religious services. They have a very clear ceremony. It's very, uh, very much in an interior building, very concentrated. And the other building is uh, actually it's something I haven't shown. It's it's opening with a glass facade to this uh, in-between space, and that's um, there's a youth group there. Then there's uh, some old people hanging around and looking Russian TV, and because most people there don't speak German, it's uh, probably 70% of the community is Russian speaking. So there's there's a lot of things going on, and 
those users are also using this uh, in between space. They're using it for a, for a cafe, and um, they're really overlaying also different things. There is this is actually the the space where um, the old synagogue from Gottfried Semper was built. So it's part of a this part of this in between space is used for commemoration also sometimes but it's, it's very limited but that's at that same space or on top of the surface they're uh, putting out their chairs and tables uh, during summertime so I think this is something we are very much interested in is that that we are offering something that and sort of planning something that is also problematic and critical certainly but uh, it's up to the users, and it's something we could speculate on, but not really uh, determine and force people. This is a, I don't actually see any other questions. Maybe uh, we will bring the evening to a close. I would like to thank you very much for this um, lecture tonight. And I would also like to say that I very much wish you to wish to see you again uh, at the AEA next year, perhaps at the end of your tables in 2007, both of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank again. you.